Mike Avon and welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek and continuing the Silmarillion synopsis series. We may be done with the first age, but there are stu still two sections left. The first being the Akalabaith, which is all about the downfall of Numenor in the second age. And it pretty much spans the entire second age in a nutshell. So it's a fairly lengthy bit. So let's get started. The chapter begins with a bit of a recap of the history of men, and it starts off with telling us that men first arose during the height of Morgoth's power in Middle-earth when he returned after being imprisoned, and that early on in their history they became corrupted by Morgoth, and because of this, you know, they had a lot of evil in their past, but that some men repented and eventually worked their way westward. Those that eventually came to Beleriand first became known as the Edine, and of these came Eärendil the Mariner, who of course we learned about a fairly good bit in the last chapter of the Quintus Silmarillion. And it tells us that after the war in which Morgoth was finally defeated, we have uh, a lot of men who were evil who had sided with Morgoth. They end up going back east, fleeing the wrath of the Valar and their armies. And they end up becoming kings of men in the east, and because of that, the lot of those men become becomes rather unhappy for the second age. But the men who aided the elves, they are actually rewarded, and besides being given teaching and long life by the Valar, they are also rewarded with a land which was raised out of the sea by Ossé and blessed by the Valar, and that land is called by the Valar Andor. But the men who are given this land, they actually are kind of, they sail there because it's an island that's between Valinor and Middle-earth, but closer to Valinor, which that's specifically stated, and so that seems a little significant. But it's, they are led there by the light of the star of Erendil, who of course is now sailing basically in outer space in his ship, and therefore is now the star, Erendil. And so they call it both Elena, which means westward, and they also call it uh, Numenor, Numenore, or Anadune, which is just basically westerness, the westland. And these men because of the blessings of the Valar, become basically the greatest men ever in Middle-earth, known as the Dunedain, meaning West Men. We get a brief history on the geography of Numenor, and it tells us that their main city, Andunie, which is a um, basically a haven, a, a port city on the western coast, uh, but there's also the the capital city, which is Armenelos, which is more in the center of the island, and that's built by Elros, who is, of course, the brother of Elrond, who chose to be counted with men as opposed to elves, unlike Elrond. He becomes known as Tarminiatur and is chosen by the Valar as the first king of Numenor. And he and his line are given long life even by Numenorean standards, and Elros himself actually lives 500 years. In fact, the more or less the, the typical rule is that most men in Numenor have about three times the lifespan of a, of a normal man, whereas the, the line of Elros has five times or even more the lifespan of a normal man in Middle-earth. So, very long-lived, and uh, this will eventually change, but we'll get to that. In Armenelos, the... Uh, King Elros has uh, planted a seedling of a white tree, which is given by the elves of Tol Erisea, which is itself a seedling of uh, their tree, which was a seedling of the tree that was planted in Tyrion upon Tuna, which was a seedling of Telperion, the original tree grown by Ivana in Valinor. So this is, you know, a few times removed a descendant of one of the two trees of Valinor, which is a pretty big deal. Armenelos is also right next to, in the center of the island, a great mountain called Minel Tarma, which basically means heaven pillar, uh, pillar of heaven. And on top of this mountain, there is a, a open space, kind of a flat area, which is hallowed uh, 
and basically reserved for one time a year. You They go to worship Iluvatar there, which is significant because this is really the only explicit reference to direct worship of Iluvatar as opposed to more of a connection with the Valar anywhere in any of Tolkien's stories. Uh, and during other parts of the year, people are allowed up there, but it's basically that the silence is so deep that it's, even though you're not necessarily going there to worship, you, don't, you just can't help but keep silent yourself. It's just, it, it has a presence. So there's that. As I mentioned earlier, of course, the Tol Arasea, the elves from there, they brought this tree over, and even apart from that, Numenorians have a lot of dealings with Tol Arasea, and because of that, they have this really big connection with elves, and they also end up having some connection with the elves who still remain in, in Middle-earth, and in part because of this, as well as because of the teaching they had from the Valar, they become much wiser and as time goes on. Now, they also become primarily interested in sea craft. They build boats and they sail. That's kind of what they do. That's They're a peaceful people. They have no need for war because they're separated from Middle-earth. They have no enemies. And so they put most of their efforts into shipbuilding and seafaring. And what we learn is that they become basically the greatest mariners ever, at least of men, uh, short of Arendil, of course, who is the greatest mariner of song, you may remember. And they end up doing a lot of really amazing things. But the Valar basically place a, a ban saying you can't sail farther west than you can still see Numenor. You still have to be able to see Numenor. And basically the rule is in place basically so that they don't seek to actually come to the Blessed Realm seeking immortality, which is, you know, basically not within human nature. Humans aren't meant to live forever at this point. And we'll learn a little bit more about that later, too. But it does tell us that the most far-sighted among the Numenorians can actually see from this westernmost point, or even from the top of Minel Tarma, they can see just a glimpse, maybe, of the, the haven of Avalone on the island of Tolerasea. And that's kind of important. So you've got a lot of seafaring that goes on, and it mostly points to the east because of this ban, and for a long time this isn't a big deal, and the people of Numenor are perfectly happy. This happiness does not last forever, of course, and that's kind of the point of this story, but initially, with their eastward seafaring, it tells us that the Numenorians not only sail to the shores of Middle-earth, where they give aid and comfort to the, the men who are still there and teach them things and try to help them out, and these men, it tells us, at first come to see the Numenorians as kind of gods because of the, the much more advanced nature of their civilization. Not only do they do this, however, it tells us they also encompass Middle-earth itself. They sail south around, you know, the, the continent of Middle-earth and come to the ocean on the other side and see the doors of the east, or the, do the doors of the morning in the east where the sun rises, which is equivalent to the doors of night in the west where they the Valar kicked Morgoth out at the end of the first age. So this is pointing to the nature of the world at this at this age being a flat world. This is part of the original conception of Middle Earth. So they've basically come all the way and literally sailed everywhere that you can sail to the east. But their hearts are turned to the west because of the bliss of Amon and all this. And over time, this desire for the bliss of Amon and immortality begins to cause a shadow, which of course is not, is, is at least in part due to the original problems caused by Morgoth in the First Age. That corruption never totally went away. They didn't become, you know, perfect people just because they were given this land by, Numen, by uh, the Valar. So they start to have this desire to sail west, and they start to murmur openly against the ban. And the elves who still visit from Tol Arisea, they start to catch wind of this, and they basically tell the Valar, and the Valar eventually send messengers trying to convince them, hey guys, this is not really what you want to do, and they basically say, well, even if you were to come to Valinor, or you know, the, any part of the Blessed Realm, you wouldn't even you wouldn't gain immortality. The land doesn't confer immortality. It's the immortal beings that live there that confer the 
blissfulness on the land, and if you came here, not only would you not gain immortality, but the the glory of the land would be so much that you would actually die faster because you're just not suited for it. Men in Numenor are not really okay with this argument. They kind of think that that's just special pleading. And they also point out that, well, Eärendil's still alive, right? And, of course, it's pointed out, well, Eärendil was counted among the elves, so that doesn't really count. That's not a good counterexample. And there's basically a lot of back and forth between the messengers and Numenorians generally, and also the king of Numenor himself. It tells us that this all took place in the days of Tarkiriatan, the shipbuilder, and his son, Taratanamir. And in this time, it tells us that they still weren't, you know, they, they weren't going to break the band because they still had enough fear of the Valar to not do anything stupid. But as they sailed east more and more, they began now to land in the shores of Middle-earth and exact tribute from the people that they had formerly you know, been benefactors of, and they start to seek more power as opposed to just being beneficent, you know, benefactors to people who live in Middle-earth. And it tells us that the people of Numenor are now divided basically into two factions. You've got the king's men, who are the ones who are loyal to the king, and the kings are at this point pretty much all in favor of going westward. And you've got the Elendili, which means elf friends. Elendil, of course, being a the name of the father of Isildur and Arian, his name means elf friend too. I mean, that's just that's what the name means. Um, and it also tells us that Tar Kiriaton or Taratonomir is the first king really to cling to life until they just really can't live anymore. And it, it, before their time, the kings would you know, as they felt old age approaching, they would essentially voluntarily abdicate the throne, hand it over to their son, and do what we will later see Aragorn doing in the appendices of the Lord of the Rings, basically kind of lay down their life voluntarily and not cling to it beyond the point where they're, you know, really capable of living. And it's 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 a weird thing in Tolkien because it's not like, what we experience necessarily in our own lives. You get the idea it's a little bit different for the Dunedain, but basically the kings after this point will cling to life to the point where they're just, you know, they're, it says witless and unmanned, which is sounds similar to the idea of being, you know, having really bad dementia and just totally frail, but whatever, you know, that's the idea basically is they become just useless as a person, and yet they're just clinging to life. It also tells us that the Numenorians now are also just generally kind of living for pleasure. They build great tombs, kind of honoring their dead, which is kind of ironic, since what they really want is to not die. But, you know, we see some of this mirrored in the later history of Gondor as well. So, I mean, it's just an interesting theme in, in Tolkien's dealings with men in civilization as opposed to elves. But at any rate, you've got all this going on, and the while the king's men mainly sail basically to establish kind of realms in Middle Earth, the Elendili still sail mostly to the northern parts of Middle Earth, where Gilgalad lives with the remainder of the Noldor, who were there from the first age, who didn't sail back. So you're starting to see a major divide between these two groups in Numenor. Now we get a brief aside telling us that Sauron, who of course had remained in Middle-earth after the War of Wrath, had begun to acquire power during the Second Age, and during the reign of the 11th King of Numenor, had set up the Tower of Barad-dûr in Mordor, and was basically trying to assert dominion over Middle-earth, but he wasn't strong enough yet really to assail the Numenorians, and so for a while he kind of withdrew from the coastal areas and just kind of built up his power. However, he ensnared, you know, men with the Nine Rings, and three of those, it tells us, were Numenorians. And after a while, he became powerful enough that he started to attack the havens that the Numenorians had built on the shores of Middle-earth. The 20th king of Numenor took an, a non-elvish name. The, the names that they had been taking before, Tarkiriaton, Taratonomir, these were more elvish, and now they start taking mannish names. The 20th king takes the name Ar-Adunakor, which means Lord of the West, 
which the Alinda Lee kind of look at and say, that seems a little presumptuous since that's kind of what the Valar are called. <laughs> Uh, and they start to worry. Nevertheless, the Alindali do maintain their loyalty to the king's house. Uh, a few more kings down the road, though, we get uh, Argamilzor, who takes things a step further, whereas Adunacor had basically kind of just let the, the white tree go untended and started using mannish tongues as opposed to elvish tongues. Gamilzor actually goes so far as to say, don't use elvish. You can't use elvish in my sight. And he also forbids anyone from, you know, helping any of the Elvis ships that come to the western coast where most of the Elindali live in Andunie. And as a result of this, the elves stop coming from Tol Arisea, and he also ends up ordering the, the Elindali to remove to the eastern coast as opposed to the western coast. Basically, they're getting kind of this paranoid conspiracy theory that the Elindali are in cahoots with the, the elves and the Valar are trying to work against, you know, the king and the king's men. So the divide is getting deeper and deeper in Numenor. As a result of this, a lot of the Elendili end up setting sail to the east and basically staying in Middle-earth in the northern regions where Gilgalad has influence. And it tells us, by the way, that their main port for the, the Elendili is Pelargir, which, if you remember your map from, you know, the Middle Earth of the Third Age, from the Lord of the Rings, is basically one of the port cities of Gondor way down in the south. And that tells you something about the geography. This is, that's considered a northern port city as opposed to the more southern areas where the king's men go. Now, the lords of Andunie, that western city, uh, they are of the faithful. They're, the, they're some of the Elendili, and they're also descended from the royal line through a uh, the fourth king has a daughter who ends up being married into their, you know, that, that family. And so they're not in line for the kingship, but they are related to the kings. And it tells us that they are, not only are they, you know, of the royal line, and not only are they of the faithful, but they're also just generally well-considered men. They're considered basically the second highest house short of the king, and they're also part of the king's council basically forever. Uh, however, they're not open about their friendship with the elves, and they try to influence the kings away from bad ideas rather than just openly coming into conflict with him. And it tells us that during the period of Argamilzor's reign, he ends up taking uh, one of the, the women of that house as a wife against her will, which that seems significant. It, you get the impression that that doesn't really happen up until this point. But he ends up having two sons. One of them, the firstborn, takes after his mother and is much more friendly with the idea of elves and all that sort of thing, whereas the younger son is more like him and doesn't really like elves and all that stuff. The laws being what they are in Numenor, the older son is going to inherit the throne, even though Gamilzor doesn't like the idea since he actually likes elves, but he does end up passing the throne to him because that's just the way it, the way it goes and they don't feel like they can break that law. This king becomes known as Tar Palantir. He resumes the use of elvish tongues uh, the name means farsighted, and he's considered basically a prophet. He, and he, one of the things that he prophesies, interestingly enough, is that when the white tree dies, that will also be the time when the line of kings fails. And that will become very significant for the later part of this story and for the history of Gondor itself. So they've got uh, that prophecy, and people actually, it tells us if he says something that's going to happen in the future, they, they consider it true. And, and even the people who don't like him are afraid of him and respect him because of this. Um, he resumes the worship of Iluvatar and gives peace to the faithful, but they are still the minority party, and he can't reverse all the damage that's been done, and it even gives us kind of a an aside in the text that basically says his repentance is too late. It's not going to save, you know, <laughs> everything, and it's it's just not going to work out, which is kind of an ominous note, and we know where things are going. 
Tar Palantir's younger brother basically opposed him openly as much as he could, and even more so in secret to the extent that he couldn't do it openly. He ends up dying before Tar Palantir, and speaking of which, I should have noted earlier, in the process of all this not quite open rebellion, the kings of Numenor start to have shorter and shorter lifespans. And yet this doesn't lead to repentance, of course, except for Tar Palantir. Uh, his younger brother dies, and his son is named Farazon, and he is a really great captain of men, In he's a great sailor and all this stuff. He's basically like really well regarded by basically everybody, but he's like his father in that he is definitely not okay with elves and all this other stuff. Tarpalantir eventually does die, leaving only a daughter, and according to the laws of Numenor, ever since an early period where they had one who one king die who had only daughters, they have made it a law that the eldest, uh, that the daughter, if there is only a daughter, becomes the ruling monarch. And so she takes up the throne as a queen. But Farazon, who is uh, kind of a do-whatever-he-wants type guy, he ends up basically marrying her by force, and because the, the king's men is the larger and more powerful party, nobody can really stop him, even though this is against the laws of Numenor because they are too closely akin to be married by their own rules. I mean, because they're basically, you know, second cousins. Uh, or, well, yeah, I think that I'm doing that right. You could test me on that. I mean, it's their, their first cousins, actually. I'm sorry. First cousins. So, they're very closely related, and they shouldn't be marrying according to the laws of Numenor. Nevertheless, he takes her and becomes king because he just takes it by force, essentially. So she doesn't have quite the sway that her father did in her own realm, unfortunately. And he becomes the most powerful king in Numenorean history. Uh, he takes the name of Arpharazon as his king's kingly name, and... Things are about to go really downhill really fast. Our Faro Zone basically hears about Sauron doing damage to their coastal havens and whatnot in Middle Earth, and being the proud, you know, person that he is, decides, well, Sauron's got to be put in his place. Nobody's going to be king in Middle Earth except me. So he takes this huge navy with a huge army, goes and lands in Middle Earth, and Sauron sees this. And basically realizes, oh, these guys are bigger and badder than I thought. Which, you know, you, you can kind of put that in perspective. Because, you know, at the end of the Second Age, when Isildur and Elendil and Anarion and all them go and fight in the Last Alliance, they can take out Sauron, and this is after the disaster that comes at the end of Numenor's history. So, I mean, Numenor is a really, really powerful civilization. So powerful that at this stage, Sauron realizes if he fights them openly, he's going to lose, and lose badly. So basically, Arpharazon basically demands that he come out and swear fealty to him. And Sauron comes, and he bends his knee and swears fealty, and you know tries to be all flattering and, and deceitful and whatnot. And he has an idea of how he's going to make this work in his favor. Arpharazon doesn't trust Sauron. And so what he decides is, well, I'm not going to let you stay in Middle-earth. You're going to come with me back to Numenor as a hostage. And Sauron pretends not to like this, but inside he's going, yes, this is exactly what I want. So he takes Sauron back, and within the space of three years, through flattery and just the, his ability to come across as a, a wise and good person, he eventually becomes the, the most influential counselor of the king. And so much so that everybody else in the council basically fawns on Sauron because he has so much favor from the king, except for Amandil, who at this point is the lord of Andunier. So there's really only one person left at this point with any kind of good influence on the king, and that's really not enough. But Sauron basically becomes the power behind the throne. Sauron uses his influence in possibly the worst way and basically starts to gainsay everything the Valar have said, saying that they, the Valar, they have invented Iluvatar. Iluvatar is not real. He's just something they made up to 
put down the Numenorians and keep them from taking their rightful place as the, the lords of all of Arda. And he starts to get men in Numenor to worship the Dark, and by extension, the Lord of the Dark, who is Melkor. And so, I mean, he's basically turning them into Satan worshippers, effectively, is what's going on. And things start to get really, really, really bad in Numenor. Many, of, even of the Elendili, end up turning away and going bad at this point, and those that don't are now pretty much openly considered as rebels, and so they have to hide their allegiances. Amondil, who was, you know, is at least distantly related to Arpharazon, had once actually been very friendly with Arpharazon in their youth, but at this point, he's dismissed from the council, and basically Arpharazon is listening to nobody but Sauron. And at this point, Sauron's influence leads him to forbid anybody from going to the Mental Tarma, and Sauron also tries to get him to cut down the white tree, which you may remember Tarpalantir's prophecy about that. He's not quite ready to do that because he still thinks Tarpalantir's prophecy is probably legit because everybody realized that Tarpalantir was a far-sighted individual who could actually prophesy things. Amandil gets wind of this idea, though, and he knows that sooner or later Sauron is going to get his way. He ends up telling his son, Elendil, and his sons, Isildur and Anarion, about what's going on, and Isildur gets the idea that he is going to solve this problem, and he does something for which afterwards he is renowned, basically, as a hero. He goes alone, in disguise, to Armenelos, to the courts of the king, sneaks in past the guards, and he takes a fruit of the white tree, but before he can get out, the alarm is raised, and he has to fight his way out, and he almost gets killed, but he narrowly escapes with the fruit of the tree and rides back to the east, where all of the Elendili basically are living at this point, and brings the fruit, and he basically lies at death's door for several days. Amandil plants the, the fruit of the tree, and over the course of the winter, it you know, it survives, and in the spring, it it blossoms, it begins to grow. And when it does, Isildur, who had been on do Death's doorstep, suddenly recovers and seems totally fine. So that connection between the line of kings and the tree definitely seems to be at play in, in this way. And after this point, you know, they keep this tree secret. But soon after that, Sauron does finally get his way, and Arpharazon does have the tree cut down. So Isildur basically got this done just in time. Of course, Sauron might have used the whole theft of the fruit event to, you know, convince Arpharazon to do it sooner. Now, Sauron had had a temple built in Armenelos, which was basically dedicated to the worship of Melkor, and one of the first things that he does in it is he burns the white tree, and the smoke of it is really, really black and that's probably not a good sign. But the other thing that they do pretty frequently there is human sacrifice, and it's usually people taken from those known to be of the faithful, uh, And but they usually do it on the charge of rebellion, which is almost always false, although there probably are some that it tells us that really were kind of rebellious because it's just a hard time to live in. But they start doing this basically on hoping that the Lord of the Darkness, Melkor, will grant them release from death. Of course, it never works. Instead, what happens is they start to become ill, which they had never really had sickness before. They start to go crazy. Madness infects them. And it also tells us that they start to take up weapons and just kill each other for no cause. Basically, the society is going completely downhill and getting worse, even though theoretically what they're doing is supposed to help them become better off. Uh, this is all going on, and eventually they're also still going to Middle-earth, and now not only are they exacting tribute, they're taking slaves, and some of those end up being uh, human sacrifice victims, and things are just really going downhill fast at this point. At this stage, even though the glory and bliss of Numenor is really kind of going downhill, the power level is still going up. And at this point, it tells us Arpharazon is the greatest tyrant that has ever been in Middle-earth after Morgoth. And 
he's starting to get old and he's starting to feel that coming on and Sauron now sees his opportunity and he basically says well you're the greatest king that's ever been and kings take what is theirs by right and they don't brook any you know any den denial from anybody else you should just go to Valinor and claim it and get your immortality now because of this our Farazone basically decides well I guess I better prepare for war and he starts building up an army and a navy to sail to the west to assault Valinor. He does this in secret. It's not exactly clear why, since at this point there's really no stopping him. Um, but Amondil gets wind of this as well, and he goes to Elendil and basically says, it's going to get really bad if they do this, and so I'm going to do what Erendil, our ancestor, did many, many years ago, and I'm going to sail to the west and try to talk the Valar into helping us out and preventing something really bad from happening. Elendil basically says, if you do that, you're just going to be seen as confirming the suspicion of rebellion on, you know, the part of the Elendili. And Amondil says, well, here's what I'm, I'm going to do it in secret. I'm basically going to sail east, pretending I'm going to go to Middle-earth, and nobody's going to care, because even at this point, our Farazone doesn't like me, and he's not going to worry about me going east. But then I'll turn around when I'm out of sight and go to the west. Meanwhile, Elendil, you need to get anybody that you know is faithful together and prepare to leave Numenor, because we don't know what's going to happen. And so Amondil ends up taking three servants, which is very reminiscent of Arendil, who had three other mariners with him on his ship, and he gets ready to sail, and eventually he does, and it tells us after he does, nothing's ever heard of him again. Nobody knows what happens. So Ironically, Amondil is the first person to break the ban, although he's doing it for good reasons. Elendil, meanwhile, does gather up as many of the faithful as he can that he knows are true and prepares ships to, basically, he doesn't know exactly what, uh, but he also gathers up the, the sapling of the tree from Isildur's fruit that he stole, and he gathers the seven stones, meaning the Palantiri, Palantiri, I should say. Um, these, it tells us, at some point, were given by the elves to the the faithful when days were starting to get darker and the elves still visited as a means of giving them comfort. This comes up, I think, in the next section on the Third Age and the Rings of Power, but it's worth mentioning here. Um, so he basically just holds himself in readiness while Arpharazon continues to build up his army and navy. In the preparation for the assault on Valinor, the weather starts to become really bad, and Numenorean ships, which had never before sunk because of the blessings of the Valar, now begin to founder on a relatively frequent basis. Um, meanwhile, the construction of the navy continues, and the weather not only gets bad, but there are really dark clouds shaped like eagles coming out of the west. Seems ominous. And there's also earthquakes. And some of the people kind of temporarily repent. They're like, oh, maybe the Valar really are kind of as powerful as we thought they were. Um, but it doesn't last long because during a storm, Sauron is basically standing on the top of his temple. And lightning strikes him and he doesn't die. And ba basically people think of him as a god at this point. Um, although it does shatter the roof of the temple. So because of this, everybody's just assuming that Sauron is just the biggest thing out there and, and they all go along with it. And the construction continues until finally our Farazone is ready to sail into the west. And basically that's, that's what he does. He gets on his ship and they start to sail west, although there's really no wind to speak of. But because they've been taking all these slaves out of Middle Earth, they basically just have them row the ships and their navy encompasses Tol Arisea so much that they block the, the light from the setting sun in the west, and they're basically in a giant shadow just from the navy. They land on the shores of Amon, and they camp around Tyrion upon Tuna, and all the elves at this point have already fled into the western parts of Valinor because they're, they don't want to deal with any of this. So they camp around Tyrion, and meanwhile, everything is quiet. In fact, whenever our far zone first arrived at the, the shores of Amon, everything was just dead silent. And at first, he was just a little bit worried about setting foot on the place. He thought, is this really a good idea? 
but his pride wins out and he does land. So at this point, when he's camping around the, the hill of Tuna, Manwe basically calls upon Iluvatar and says, all right, what are we going to do here? And the Valar tells us, surrender their authority. And Iluvatar himself steps in and, well, reshapes the world, basically. It tells us that the armies of Aradun, I mean, uh, not Adunakor, I'm getting my kings mixed up, Arpharazon, are basically buried under falling hills. But the more significant thing that happens is a huge chasm is opened between Tol Erisea and Numenor, and the oceans basically rush into this chasm, and the chasm is close enough to Numenor that its foundations are broken, and it begins to collapse into the sea. And, well, as a result of this, we end up with a world which is round. The continent of Amon and Tol Erisea are withdrawn from Arda, out, you know, somewhere else, and the rest of Arda is now bent into the spherical shape that we know of as the world. Elendil and his ships with Isildur and Arian are, because they're on the eastern side of Numenor, they are protected from the, just the, the draw of the water into the chasm, and thus they aren't swallowed up, but eventually a huge wind comes out of the west, which just I wouldn't even call it sailing. They're basically just thrown to the shores of Middle Earth, and they end up setting up, of course, the kingdoms of Arnor and Gondor. These are nowhere near as glorious as Numenor, but they do recall its glory to some extent. And of course, to the rest of the men in Middle Earth, they are way above their level still. Sauron was in the temple at the point where all this happened. And he kind of got an idea of what was happening, and he was just kind of laughing maniacally to himself at how stupid our fire zone was and how he was going to get himself killed. But he wasn't expecting the huge response that he actually got. And when the foundations of Numenor started to crumble with a huge earthquake, he realized, oh, this is bad. He ends up getting basically swallowed into the abyss with his own temple and the island of Numenor itself, and his, his body is destroyed. But his spirit flees back to Mordor, where he had left the ring, which he had forged way, way earlier. And so he takes the ring back up again and starts to rebuild his power. Uh, but he can no longer take a form that seems, you know, beautiful or well-seeming. He can't, he can basically only ever look really, really bad. Um, and it tells us that the eye of Sauron few can endure not meaning the flaming ball, but literally an eye in a, you know, more or less physical body. Um, so Sauron now is basically always going to look like a bad guy. Kind of the same thing that happened to Morgoth way early on in the Silmarillion. After this, because of the downfall of Numenor, they, the men who survived the downfall now end up calling it the Akalabeth, the downfallen, which in Elvish is Atalante. And believe it or not, Tolkien said that the, the, the similarity between Atalante and Atlantis was purely uh, coincidental. He had already developed the root word for what it means to, to fall down in Elvish, and it just happened to work out this way. You have to wonder about that. Nevertheless, the name Atalante means downfall in Elvish, one way or the other. The men who survive and make their homes in Middle-earth um, some of them believe that the peak of Men Tarma still stands above the oceans, thinking, bas reasoning basically that because it was never defiled, even by Sauron, it might still be out there because it was, you know, something that was never, never really sullied. But they hope they, they can actually go and find it because if, you know, the, like I said before, the far-sighted among them could stand on the peak of Minel Tarma and from there catch a glimpse of the Blessed Realm. But many, many sailors try to find it and never really do. Also, they reason that because the elves can still sail to Amon or Tol Arisea from Middle Earth, even though men can't by and large do that, they think that there must be some kind of a straight road as opposed to the bent road of the sphere now that still leads to Amon and Tolerisea, and they 
even have rumors of stories of mariners who end up sailing and apparently by chance or some grace finding the straight road and seeing the world kind of sink beneath them and they eventually catch a a glimpse of the the blessed realm just before they die now you get the idea that these mariners who do this are people who are already kind of on death's doorstep or or for some reason you know not likely to survive which begs the question where do these rumors come from i mean how do they start these stories unless it's just kind of like people postulating things but there's just this idea that they just can't really let go of the idea that it's out there they know it's out there they just can't get there but they still can't let go of the idea that maybe you could get there because the elves can and so there's kind of a a really bittersweet nature to that to that longing but for most men, and possibly all men, depending on how you take the rumors, uh, everybody who sails west finds eventually that they just come back to where they were. They basically just make a circuit around the globe, and they realize, well, all paths are bent, and the world is now smaller than it used to be, because literally smaller, because the continent of Amman is out. Although it, do it does tell us that new continents were raised out of the oceans as well as part of this reshaping of the world. And that is the story of the downfall of Numenor. So, hope you enjoyed that video. Hope that gave you an interesting thumbnail sketch of the Second Age. Not many stories come out of the Second Age, but there are a few, and I'll eventually get some more videos on those. Uh, but it's definitely an interesting period that would have been fun to look at in more detail if Tolkien had ever gotten around to it. This, however, is basically the most history of Numenor that we get in a single place at one time, and so even though it's not technically part of the Silmarillion, I thought it was definitely worth counting into the Silmarillion synopsis series. So, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, do give it a thumbs up, share it around for anybody else interested in Numenorean history. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter at JRRTLore for keeping up with the videos and for occasional Tolkien trivia questions. You can subscribe to the channel here. Don't forget to click that bell icon. You can support the channel here and you can find two of my previous videos here. Until the next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek signing out for the Tolkien Lore Channel. Namadier.